Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight at our Caltech Astronomy Stargazing Lecture. This is the final event that we're hosting. Um, uh, by the fan, would you mind clicking the button on the left side? I can hear it's quite loud and I know it. Oh, or okay. Sam will get it. I mean, it's good to have ventilation and filtering. So, you know, we all know there's bad bacteria in the air or virus in the air, but it can be a little loud and cumbersome. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us for our, our final event of 2023. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm your, your host for this evening, this evening's activities. And we, we host these once a, once a month on Friday nights. Our next event um, is Friday, June 12th. Put it on your calendars. Uh, I haven't yet figured out what the topic will be, but, um, but we'll have it nonetheless in here at 8 o'clock. And I'm sorry, January. Did I say June? Yeah. Okay, forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm a little addled right now. Um, Friday, January 12th. Maybe we'll do it June 12th as well. I haven't thought that far in advance, but certainly January 12th will be our next event. And uh, these events uh, can consist of a, a, a 30 minute presentation by some local researcher talking about either their research or, or a scientific topic that they're very knowledgeable on and passionate about. And and, and then uh, we have a, a brief Q&A with that speaker, five to 10 minutes or so of questions. And then we, then it becomes a little choose your own adventure-y. Um, so th that's what'll happen at about 8.40 tonight. We'll have, uh, you can either remain here in the auditorium and we'll have a Q&A panel consisting of the speaker, uh, myself and two other members of the department, each working on different areas of, of astronomy and astrophysics to essentially field questions from all of you on whatever space related topics that you may have. And that'll go on for about an hour, but concurrent with that, we'll have telescopes set up on the adjacent athletic fields where you can go look through the telescopes at various objects in the sky. Tonight, I think the prime targets, you may have probably already seen them when you arrived, are Jupiter and Saturn that are both very high in the, in the evening sky. And the conditions tonight are very, very good. They're very clear. It's not even too cold. I mean, it's brisk, but it's not too cold. Um, and, and so, so there'll be that wonderful opportunity. So you're encouraged if you wanna go check out things and then come back or check out and then just leave or, or whatever order you wanna do it. But we'll be going until about 9.45 or so, both on the telescopes as well in, as, as in here. Um, these events are live streamed on YouTube right now. We're live streaming and thus it's also being recorded. So if there's something like you, you missed during the talk or, or you wanna check or, or you coughed really loudly and wanted proof that you coughed really loudly at whatever time, um, you can go on our YouTube channel and watch the lecture after the after the fact. We have the last seven years worth of lectures online on various different topics, from from black holes to uh, life in the universe to uh, the expansion of of the universe, all sorts of things that are there. So so I encourage you to to check it out and and see some of our past events. In addition to these stargazing lectures, we have what are known as astronomy on tap. That's a, an activity that takes place at a bar in Old Town, Pasadena. These events happen on Monday nights as opposed to Friday nights for our, for our stargazing lectures. And uh, they're a little less formal given that they're at a bar. It's an outdoor patio space at the bar known as Dog House, which is on uh, Fair Oaks and, and, and Green Street, just in Old Town a few miles from here. And uh, at those events, we have two 15 to 20 minute presentations given by local researchers, not just Caltech researchers, but scientists from NASA JPL or uh, IPAC or the Carnegie Observatories or UCLA or, or wherever I can find speakers. And, and then there's also associated um, astronomy themed pub trivia. There's live music by a local rock band. Um, there's telescopes at that as well. Although the telescopes here are better because we have darker skies over here in, uh, on the athletic fields. And our next one of those will be Monday, January 29th, January 29th, not June 29th. Uh, and our speaker actually is in the audience. Kostov, you're giving a talk. So uh, Kostov, what were you going to talk about? I, well, it, it's about uh, some of the stories associated with some of the objects in the sky, like mythological stories associated with some of the objects. Yes, perfect. 
So that will be one of the talks, and I'm not sure what the other talk will be, but it'll be splendid, I promise. So, um, so if you're interested, come join us for that. But again, those happen once a month as well. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out, just to make sure everyone is aware, there is going to be a solar, a total solar eclipse that that covers uh, the eastern to central part of the United States, where the the, the path of totality happens. That will happen on Monday, April eighth, uh, roughly mid morning to late morning, depending on where in the United States you are. From here, we will see it as a fifty percent, roughly fifty percent coverage of the the moon passing between us and and the sun. So you wouldn't probably notice if you didn't know that it was going to happen, and you will know because it will be all in the media and all in the news. But if you travel to those destinations, to the place where where you get totality, where the moon completely blocks out the sun for a few minutes in the middle of the day, um, it's really cool. I'm trying to set up events that will take place probably along the Texas-Mexico border um, or deeper into Mexico. I'm working on it, and I'll let you guys know. I mean, not that you have to come to our events, but there's there will be plenty of events, but our events are going to be pretty sweet, I promise. So, um, so I will keep you posted. We should probably have the details worked on that uh, by next month after the holidays. So I'll, I'll post online and on our social media and such, as well as, as our future events. So uh, stay posted on that. Um, I think those are all of my announcements. So I will start by introducing our speaker for tonight. Our speaker is a brand new professor in the department. He did, uh, let's see, he originally hails from Oregon, from Southern Oregon, and did his undergraduate studies at Yale. And then he did his PhD, actually, when he was an undergraduate doing his undergraduate studies at Yale, he was a an intern here for a summer working in the group that actually I work work in um, and demonstrated that he was pretty awesome during that time and then went on to being a graduate student and getting his PhD at UC Berkeley, a few hours to the north of here before doing a postdoctoral research position at Harvard. And he did that for two years, and then he just joined us this fall. And the nature of his research is really dynamic. It covers a lot of different topics, including uh, what we're going to hear about tonight on these kind of lurking, quiet black holes throughout the universe. Don't worry, they're not coming to consume us just yet, or I guess we'll find out. But um, as well as stellar evolution and, a, and gal galactic evolution, really really covering a broad range of topics at a really high level. And it's really my pleasure because he's super up and coming and awesome and a really good guy too. Um, uh, I'm really pleased to, to, uh, to introduce Dr. Kareem El Badri. So this is an artist's rendition of a black hole. It looks pretty obvious here, but in real life, they're not quite like, this easy to find. Uh, and before I, I get into it, I thought I could just say something about what a black hole is. So a black hole is basically a region of space where gravity has won, uh, <laughs> where we put as much mass as you can possibly put into as small of a volume as you can possibly put it. So the density is so high and gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. So that's sort of a, <coughs> a phenomenological description of what a black hole is. I, you might say, well, how does a black hole form? And we actually don't know all the ways that black holes form. We have ideas. We know one of the ways that black holes can form is through the death of a massive star. Uh, that's the way we understand the, be uh, the best. So, I'm going to talk mostly about black holes in the Milky Way, but it's hard to see the Milky Way, at least the whole thing, because we're inside it, and there are all these stars in the way, and gas, and dust. And so what I have here is a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the closest big galaxy to us, the closest galaxy that looks pretty much like the Milky Way. Uh, this is an image uh, based on data from a satellite called Galax, which is run out of Caltech. It, it, it's uh, images in the ultraviolet, so you see a lot of hot stars in it. Uh, and I, I'm going to start with a question for the audience, uh, so you can shout out the answer if you know. 
Uh, where in this image would I find the black hole? That's what we got. Okay, good. Uh, so, indeed, we know that most galaxies, uh, perhaps all galaxies, have these supermassive black holes at the center. Uh, they usually have masses of like millions to billions of times the mass of the sun. And what I'm showing here is a picture taken with the event horizon telescope. Uh, not of the black hole at the center of the Andromeda galaxy, we don't have a picture of that one yet, but the one at the center of the Milky Way. Um, the one at the center of the Milky Way is about 4 million times the mass of the Sun. So it's pretty big, but it's actually on the smaller side by supermassive black hole standards. The one in the center of Andromeda, which we know is there, although we don't have a picture, is about 100 million times the mass of the Sun. So quite a bit bigger. And then we you know of other galaxies that go up to something like 10 billion times the mass of the Sun. Right, but my question was, was sort of a trick question because this is, this is, the, this is one of the black holes uh, in the image. Uh, but actually there are a lot more. <laughs> but I've just drawn a bunch of them <laughs> on here. Uh, that would be one of the, one of the things I uh, take away from the talk is that really the black holes are mixed in with the stars. And although you can't see them, and, uh, you can't see most of them, uh, and, and it's hard to find individual ones, even if you look really hard, uh, we have good evidence that millions or, or you know, hundreds of millions of these black holes uh, exist in all galaxies uh, just interspersed with the stars. Uh, and if you just consider the Milky Way, so we have the one big black hole at the center, it's about 4 million times the mass of the sun, uh, but we have something like 100 million smaller black holes. Uh, and each one of them is about 10 times the mass of the sun on average, we think. And so if you just consider the total mass in black holes, all the little ones actually went out uh, by more than a factor of 100 compared to the one big one in the center. So, uh, how do we know that, that these black holes exist? Well, it turns out some of them we can see. Uh, so the, the kind of black hole that we've known about for the longest, the, the first black hole, black holes, is a system called X-ray binaries. And so these are binary systems where you have a black hole, one of the small kind, something like 10 times the mass of the sun, that's orbited in a really close orbit by a star, just a normal star like the sun. Uh, and the black hole is basically slowly eating the star. So there's material being transferred, there's being uh, transferred from the star onto the black hole. Uh, when it does that, it falls into this deep gravitational potential, we call it. Basically, it, it falls into the black hole and it releases a huge amount of gravitational energy. So it would like to, to just fall directly in, but it, it, it turns out it can't do that because it has a angular momentum. Uh, and that makes it form this disk of gas around the black hole. And this disk of gas, you know, it, it has a gas in it that close to the event horizon is swirling around at close to the speed of light, so it gets really hot. And it shines brightly in X-rays. That's why it's, things are called X-ray binaries. They're, they're something like a million degrees Kelvin, uh, a million degrees Celsius. Uh, and because of that, they emit most of their light at long, at, sorry, at really short wavelengths, high energy like X-rays. And if you have an X-ray telescope, we've had for I mean, 50 years now, and you turn it on and look at the sky, you see a bunch of bright points of light that emit the X-rays, and most of them are the, most of the brightest ones are these black hole X-ray binaries. We have a black hole slowly consuming a star. Here's a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, what we looked at before in the Violet, but now in X-rays. This is based on, on data with a telescope called XMM Newton. Uh, this telescope spent like a month looking at the Andromeda galaxy, filing it in a bunch of different patches. And you see there are lots of sources, uh, lots of little dots, each of which are emitting X-rays. And almost all of these are these X-ray binaries, where I may have a black hole, slowly consuming a star, or in some cases you have what's called a neutron star uh, consuming a star. I mean, neutron stars are sort of, one way you can think of them is kind of like failed black holes. Uh, they're, they're massive stars that collapsed to really high density, but they didn't have quite enough mass to collapse all the way to become a black hole. 
Uh, another kind of black holes that you may have heard of and, and that we've been studying out are those that merge through gravitational waves. So there's, a, there's an instrument called LIGO that uh, much of which was developed at Caltech uh, that tries to detect the gravitational waves and merging black holes. And so basically, like I said, black holes are regions space where gravity is one. And so if you have two of them, you put them together in a closed binary, as they orbit around each other, it kind of perturbs the, the fabric of space-time around them, and these ripples carry away energy. And the strength of the ripples gets stronger and stronger as the black holes get closer and closer until eventually they merge from one big black hole. Uh, and during that merger, they release a colossal amount of energy through these gravitational waves. And ex extremely precise detectors here on Earth can detect these ripples in space time. And so, what I've shown here on the right panel, I won't go into detail about what's shown, but this is the signal detected from the first merging black hole detected back in 2015. All right, and so, this is a new method. You know, until about 10 years ago, uh, when I started thinking about astronomy, there were no black holes detected this way. Uh, but now already we've detected something like 100 merging black holes. So, so here's a, a, a Argus rendition of all the black holes that have been detected as of a year ago or so by, by gravitational waves. There are all these blue points. So the, the vertical scale is showing the mass of the black holes. And you see there are always two points that then come together to make a third point. So like initially the masses were 10, 10 solar masses, and they come together and they make an 18 solar mass black hole. Not a 20 solar mass black hole because some of their mass is converted into energy. Uh, and so nowadays, these gravitational wave detectors are pretty efficient, and we detect these merging black holes when, when LIGO, the gravitational wave observatory, is when it's on, we detect them roughly once a day or every couple of days. Uh, so it's gone from, from uh, you know, being a hope on the horizon that one day we might detect to being detected pretty routinely. Okay, so let's go back to our map of the Andromeda. Uh, and, and now I'm going to show all the merging black holes uh, in Andromeda and gravitational waves. Okay, that's all of them. <laughs> uh, it, it turns out these merging black holes that we detect by gravitational waves are actually really rare. So there are probably binary black holes somewhere in Andromeda, uh, but they're not yet close enough that we can detect them. And if we just looked at Andromeda and waited to detect the gravitational wave merger, we'd have to wait uh, something like 10 million years. So it's about every 10 million years that a galaxy like Andromeda or the Milky Way has one of these gravitational wave mergers made. So then how are we detecting them every day? Well, they're very bright, or rather they're dark, but they're, they're very uh, energetic. And so when they merge, we can detect them all across the universe. So there are galaxies that are, you know, halfway across the observable universe that the two black holes and then merge, and we can detect them here on Earth. Uh, but if you're thinking about sort of the, the routine run of the mill black holes uh, that exist in the Milky Way or nearby galaxies, most of them never end up in these kind of merging black hole gravitational wave systems. Uh, so another kind of black hole uh, that you might want to detect, uh, certainly that I want to detect, this is what a lot of my research is about, uh, is black holes in, in wider binaries. So sort of like the X-ray binaries, where you have a star orbiting a black hole, but just too far apart for there to actually be gas falling off the black hole. So you just have a star feeling the gravity of the black hole going around in orbit, like the Earth goes around the sun, uh, but not transferring any matter. Uh, and, and we have some reason to believe, just from models of, of how binaries form and, and how uh, uh, black holes in, in binaries form, that these kind of systems might be much more common than the kind that we can detect in X-rays. Uh, so, so we've been looking for them for a while, but of course it's harder because we can't just turn on an X-ray telescope and pick them out. Uh, we have to instead but we can't see the black hole, so we have to instead just observe the star and infer the presence of the black hole from how the star is moving. 
Uh, and so this has recently gone from being, you know, a, a light, so, sort of light with gravitational waves. This has gone from being a dream that one day we might be able to do uh, to something that we can now do. Uh, so far, only in a few cases, but we think pretty soon it'll be routine. All thanks to this mission called Gaia. So Gaia is a satellite uh, in space run by the European Space Agency. Here's just a little movie showing what it does. So it's got these two cameras on it, it's rotating, and the cameras are constantly scanning the sky, sweeping out a ring. But then the axis of rotation is processing, and so over time, the ring that's being swept out moves across the sky, and after about a month, Gaia has scanned the whole sky. And then it just keeps processing and does it again. And so basically every path of the sky gets visited over and over again, has a, a, a picture taken of it, and that's all Gaia does. So Gaia's job is to take pictures of the sky, whole sky, and then measure very precisely where the stars are each time. Uh, and first it sounds kind of boring, right? You know, most the stars are far away, gonna, most of them don't change uh, from night to night. Uh, but really the magic of Gaia is just that it can do these measurements really, really precisely. So the, preci the precision with which it can measure where a star is when we can't look is something like a hundredth of a milli arc second. Uh, if that number doesn't mean anything to you, now uh, here's an analogy. So imagine a telescope and look at the moon. A uh, hundredth of a milli arc second is the size of a quarter uh, on the moon as you from Earth. So you can imagine a quarter on the moon take a picture of it with Gaia, then move the quarter over by one quarter diameter, that motion, I could Gaia could detect. So it's just an it's like unfathomably small angle it can detect. Uh, and because of that, it can detect motions of stars in the Milky Way for all kinds of reasons. So for example, all the stars in the Milky Way, when we look at them from Earth or from Gaia, are moving uh, because the Earth is going around the sun, right? So we can detect that apparent motion relative to stars that are farther away because of our motion. That lets us measure how far away the stars are. Uh, but, but more interestingly, for our purposes, some stars are also moving because they're orbiting something. Uh, and so every time Gaia looks at a star, it'll be in a bit like that, it'll be in a different place. And if, it, if you do that many times over the course of a few years, Eventually, you see a lot of the stars are tracing out a circle on the sky, uh, kind of like this is an example with real, real data. Uh, and from that circle, we're using Kepler's laws, or Newton's laws, uh, we can predict, uh, we can basically measure the mass of what the object being orbited is. And in some cases, it'll just be another star, but in other cases, it'll be a black hole. And so, uh, in the last a uh, year or so, the, the first data that lets us do this uh, has, has finally uh, become available from Gaia. I, and uh, my group has found a couple black holes uh, using this method. So here I'm showing data for the first one. We created called uh, HD1. Uh, the second one is HD2. Uh, and so really to characterize these black holes, we need two kinds of data. So one is what Gaia gives us, motion on the plane of the sky. Right, but that's only two, di two dimensions out of three, because most of the time the orbit isn't exactly aligned with the plane of the sky, but it's tilted somehow. So to get the full orbit, we also want to see how the star is moving towards us or away from us. And that we can measure with spectrographs right, on using telescopes on the ground. So what one telescope we use for this a lot is Keck in Hawaii. And each time we look at the star, we can take a spectrum, we can measure its Doppler shift. So are, is it, is, are the, the lines in the spectrum shifted blueward, or blue shifted, or are they red shifted? Uh, and then we can do that many times, each time measure our velocity, and you combine those measurements of velocity along your line of sight with the motion on the plane of the sky from Gaia, you get a full three-dimensional orbit. Uh, which you can solve then for, for the mass of the unseen object. And so here I have a little movie, this is produced by ESA, showing the orbits of one of these black holes we found. 
Uh, and of course, you, know, you can't actually see black hole, but uh, here, so all we have to observe is the star going around. But here, the black hole is added for, I think you can see it lending some of the stars in the background. Uh, and this, this system here is, is an orbit similar to the size of the Earth going around the sun. So it's a little bit like you took the orbit of the Earth going around the sun, but replaced the sun with a black hole and replaced the Earth with the sun. Uh, and we think, Although so far we've only found two of these, uh, that these kind of systems are actually very common. Uh, and, and we're just, uh, you know, because we're just developing a technology, we can so far only find the most obvious ones. But we, we expect to find more. Um, and just to show that, here's a, a graph. It's a little busy, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, so this is basically all of the stellar black holes in the Milky Way uh, that we know of. Uh, the plot on the x-axis is the orbital period of the binary, which is basically a measure of how close the star and the black hole are uh, to each other. So short period means they're going around each other really fast, but those are the x-ray binaries. And then the y-axis is how far away they are from the sun. And so we notice about these two black holes we found with Gaia compared to the x-ray binaries I talked about before. Is they have much longer orbital periods, so they're they're farther apart. Well, that's why we don't see them in X-rays. Uh, but they're closer to us than any X-ray binaries. And one of the basic thing, uh, basic starting assumptions in astronomy is that we're not in a special place in the universe; that we're just kind of a random place in the galaxy. And if that's true, then we expect the closest black holes to us uh, to be sort of the most common ones. Like these x ray binaries, if there were one that were closer, we'd see it, it'd be easy, it'd be super bright in x rays. So we see the ones that are closest, and those are farther away than these dormant uh, black holes that we only see via the gravitational effects. Uh, okay, so that was black holes and binaries. And now what about black holes that aren't orbiting, aren't orbited by a star? Is there any hope of detecting those? So here's an artist's rendition of a completely isolated black hole. <laughs> uh, it's not that exciting. Uh, and so, so the first takeaway is very, these kind of black holes are very hard to find. Uh, but it's actually not completely hopeless. And the reason is that although they, they don't emit any light, the universe is still full of other stuff that does emit light. So really, we've got all these stars, and galaxies in the background. Uh, and occasionally, one of these black who just happened to pass between us and one of these background stars. Uh, and so this is a, something called gravitational lensing. Uh, you may have seen pictures of like lens galaxies where, where the light is, is distorted uh, by a, a foreground black hole or a foreground galaxy. Uh, but in the case of a stellar mass black hole and a background star, which right now is the most common way to find these kind of black holes, uh, basically, you, you, you're looking at a star, black hole happens to pass right between you and it through your line of sight. And the black hole, you can think of it as it focuses the light from the, that, that would have gone in other directions, focuses it all into your line of sight. So you get some of the light that was going to go other places. And because of that, you can just monitor how bright the star is. It looks like it gets brighter. And so it's plotted here in the bottom how bright the star looks. The brightest when black hole is right in front of the star, and the same here again. And so th this suggests a, a way to find isolated black holes. You just look at a lot of background stars and wait for some of them just to get brighter, and then paint here again. All right. So this now is an actual picture of the Milky Way. This is also this is also using data from Gaia. I take the picture. It's actually not a picture. But it's a graph where every point is a star, is a position of a star that's measured by Gaia. Uh, so there's something like two billion stars in the image. So if I want to find a black hole, anyone have like using this kind of lensing uh, method? Anyone have any ideas for what, what where the best place to look is? Right. Uh, so. The easiest place is kind of near the middle. Uh, and the reason is just that you have a lot of background sources there. 
So you have a higher chance of a black hole happening to, to go in front of them, you know, assuming that the black holes are kind of not all in one part of the sky. Okay. Uh, so people have been looking for a while now. Um, and maybe the, the most successful, one of the most successful uh, program looking for these black holes is called Oval, the optical gravitational lensing experiment. Uh, is run with a telescope in Chile. And basically, the main goal of this telescope is to take pictures of that little bright patch of the Milky Way that has a lot of stars in it every night. Uh, and it's been doing this for, for over 20 years now. So, in that patch of sky, there are a few billion stars bright enough for, for a world to look at. And each one of them has brightness measurements over many years. And so, it turns out if you look at a billion stars, uh, you actually detect a ton of these microlensing events. So uh, it turns out the what, what astronomers call the microlensing optical depth. Uh, it's about one in a million. So what that means is if you look toward the galactic center, you have to look at about a million stars before you find one that just happens to be undergoing a lensing event right now. So here are some example light curves that this, this uh, uh, program has found. Uh, but what I didn't tell you is that uh, although this is a good way to find candidate black holes, it's not actually guaranteed that all of these events are caused by black holes. And the reason is that actually any object with mass can do this lensing. So black holes have the most mass, right, given a size, and so they they sort of have the largest cross section. Right? But if 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 something less massive gets you know, even even more along your line of sight, uh, it can also make the background sort of brighter like this. And so just from this kind of data, it's very hard to tell the difference between you know, a black hole or a low mass star or a white dwarf, uh, other kinds of massive and, and, and dark objects that uh, we know exist in space. Uh, but it turns out uh, there is a way to, to do better and break that degeneracy. Uh, and I won't go into a ton of detail, but basically, with these kind of light curve measurements, you can't really tell the difference between a lower mass and a higher mass object. But there's another effect from lensing that's smaller, which is that the position of a background star changes a little bit on the sky, you know, again by less than a million arc seconds uh, during the, the lensing event. And if you can measure that relative change in position, then you can better measure the mass of a landing object. And so it turns out that that, that measurement you have to make is it, so precise that right now you can only do it reliably, or at least you can most easily do it from space. And so there was a, a big discovery a year ago, uh, led by uh, by two groups, uh, but one of them was led by a, a postdoc who is at Carnegie Observatories uh, now, and uh, named Casey Lamb. Uh, is, is in Pasadena, just a couple miles away, uh, where the Hubble Space Telescope looked at one of these lensing events where a star got brighter and fainter, and at the same time, they were very precise in how the star was moving on the sky. And so you can see here the images that Hubble took and over the course of several years. You can see here this, this is a star that was lens, it was brighter and got fainter, and it also measured how that star moved on the sky. I turn it to be patient for this. You have to take measurements over the course of something like a decade before uh, you have a confident mass measurement. Uh, but, but this this was the one event so far uh, where where uh, we're able to measure the shift and confirm that the landing object really was a black hole. So so far, just one black hole detected like this. Uh, but of course, these kind of chance alignments where a black hole just happens to go in front of a background star, it don't happen very often. So if you detect one black hole that way, you know there are a lot of other ones that just barely missed that you didn't see. So I, a lot of times in astronomy, we, we look at some kind of iceberg where we have a population that's easy to find, but it represents only a, a small fraction of, of the whole iceberg, and then a, a bigger population that's harder to find. And so right now for black holes, the easier to find 
object of the x-ray binaries and the gravitational wave events, uh, both of which, uh, you know, at least in some cases, uh, we, can, we can connect pretty easily, uh, but both of which are really rare astrophysical outcomes of, of, uh, of black hole evolution. We think probably only a tiny fraction of black holes ever end up in that kind of system. And then underneath the iceberg, uh, we have uh, underneath the, the surface, we have the isolated black holes, and then black holes in wider binaries ordered by stars uh, that we're just starting to be able to detect, but we think probably vastly outnumber uh, the easier to find time. Uh, and so in the last couple of minutes, I was talking through how we know how I got to that number that I started with, which should be 100 million of these. So this is a picture of a star. Uh, the star is called Zeta Off. It's, a, it's actually a naked eye star. You can, you can see it uh, by, without a telescope. Uh, so Zeta Off has a distinction of being the nearest massive star to the sun. And when I say massive, what I mean here is more than about 20 times the mass of the sun. And the reason I pick that is that that's roughly, we think, the mass above which a lot of stars or black holes when they die. Um, so they are is about 20 times the mass of the sun, but it's about 200,000 times brighter than the sun. So more massive stars are much more than this. Uh, about 300 light years away. But they are, like all massive stars, has a cosmically short lifetime. So, uh, or I should say there are about 30,000 stars like this in the Milky Way, 30,000 massive stars. We know that because we can count them. They're so bright that uh, most of them we just see. The only ones we can't see are behind dust, and we can infer how many of those there are. So about 30,000 of them. Uh, but their typical lifetime is something like 3 million years. So that doesn't seem short by human standards, but it's very short by, by astronomical standards. Uh, and when they die, a lot of them turn into black holes. So, to to put that age into context, like the age of the Milky Way is about 10 billion, not million, but 10 billion years old. Uh, and so for each star uh, that you see like this today, there are many, many more that have already died. And so roughly, if we assume that stars being born and dying at a constant rate, which isn't a terrible assumption, uh, there should be this ratio, 10 billion over 3 million times 30,000 black holes in the Milky Way. And so if you do that math, you find 100 million black holes in the Milky Way, of which so far we found less than 100. Where we, we found like tons of the X-ray binaries, a couple of the isolated, or a couple of the ones that aren't accreting all the by star, one micro one thing. Uh, but there should be 100 million. And the closest one to us should be something like 30 light years away, which again is a short distance on astronomical scales. Like the, the closest star is something like four light years away. The closest black hole should be maybe 10 times that far, really not that much farther. You know, they're much smaller than the, than the distance in the center of the Milky Way or anything like that. Right? And so really we think these black holes are all around us, right? And we're just now starting to be able to look under the under the water at the rest of the iceberg. So I'll, I'll end there and, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Is there a do you have a curve of you know, mass versus population of these estimated stars? Uh, for, for all stars? Or for, or for the black holes, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's one of the main things we're trying to measure, uh, but not really. Uh, so among the stars in the Milky the, among the black holes we know of in the Milky Way, almost all of them are around 10 times the mass of the sun. Uh, like, sort of like 5 to 12 times the mass of the sun. Really. But it's a relatively narrow range. It's, especially compared to the range of stars that there are. But that the most massive stars we know are like a few hundred times the mass of the sun. But it seems like they all still form black holes that are less than 
about 15 or, or so uh, polar masses. So uh, that's true for the ones in the Milky Way. The ones that we just detected in gravitational waves when they emerge, those are mostly more massive, from like 28 to, to 50 times the mass of the sun. Uh, but we think that's at least a large part of the selection effect that the more massive ones make bigger gravity waves so we can find them more easily. Uh, so it seems like the, the, the most common black hole mass across the universe, at least among all the ones we can detect, is around 10 to Additional questions, yeah. What is the theoretical minimum size of a black hole? Theoretical. Uh, I think there isn't really one, like the size of a, of a proton or something like that. Uh, the question is how to make it. Um, one of the things that sets the theoretical limit of what black hole would still exist is that black holes that are small, basically all black holes lose mass over time by something called quantum radiation. But small black holes do that faster. So black holes that are that have masses, I think it's it's less than like the mass of a mountain or something like that, will decay within the age of the universe. So assuming that they're not being produced all the time by some process you don't know of, you know, you don't expect any to be alive that exist today that are are less massive than I think it's something like a mountain. I actually forget the number. Uh, but it's a pretty small number. So the real problem is we don't know of ways to make black holes that are less massive than the sun through astrophysical processes. There are some hypotheses that maybe early in the universe, some black holes formed that, you know, when the universe was really dense everywhere in the first few fractions of a second, you could have formed black holes of different masses, some of which would still be around today. Uh, and there's not really any any theoretical limit on, on their masses. Additional ah. Thank you. Uh, based on your observations, are you able to tell if uh, black holes are like evenly or randomly distributed around the universe, or are there like areas where they're more concentrated or less concentrated? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it seems like they're not uniformly distributed. And so one way you can see that, if I go back to the X-ray image in Andromeda. You can see here, at least in Andromeda, the ones that produce X-rays are mostly in the center. Well, not exactly in the center, but in the center a few thousand light years. Uh, now we kind of understand why that is. First of all, there are more stars there too, and they form from stars. So the first order they're in the same place as the stars that they came from. Uh, but also black holes, because they're, they're more massive than the average star, they tend to sink to the, the center of the, of the gravitational potential. And so we think that sort of around the supermassive black hole, there should be lots of smaller black holes as well. Uh, but there are still lots of them out uh, in the sort of galactic suburbs as well. Um, and then uh, almost all of the black holes we found seem to be in galaxies. Uh, that would make sense if they're all coming from stars, uh, but probably not all of them are in galaxies. We think sometimes when black holes are born, they're, they're in the process of supernova explosion, they get what we call a kick, which is just that they, they go flying off in some direction at a speed faster than the escape velocity of the galaxy. And so there are probably some black holes from that way that are shooting between galaxies as well, but they're just harder to, to find if it were there in the galaxy. Questions? Qu questions? Um, so, in some of the like, modern renditions of like black holes that I've seen on the internet, there appears to be like those jets of gas coming out of black holes. And I guess my question would be, how can something escape the gravity of black hole even uh, even if light cannot technically escape it? Yeah, that's a great question. So I uh, think I have a picture here, but there are lots of both artist renditions and real observations of jets coming from black holes. Uh, so the basic answer is that we think jets are powered by spin energy. Uh, 
So black holes form from objects that were large and rotating, and then as they get smaller, they spin faster and faster. Um, but even spin energy can't eject things from a black hole. But basically, the sort of immediate surroundings of the black hole have a lot of energy uh, coupled between the black hole and the outside by a magnetic field. Uh, and that can tap into the spin of the black hole uh, and, and power these jets. But the material is not actually leaving the black hole. It's, it's material that is falling off the black hole. Some of it goes in, some of it gets shot out. Uh, but once, it's, once it gets to the event horizon, that's it. It's not getting shot out. We'll take one more question before we do our Q&A panel. So don't worry if your question doesn't get asked. You can stick around during the Q&A panel and Kareem will still be here as well as the other members of our panel to be able to, to address whatever questions. But who, who, who's my last question for, for the, okay, there's my last question. Okay, I, I have a question. So this is, this is a picture that's taken from one perspective, one POV. So if you were to take the camera and go around to the other side, would you still see that black hole from the other side or would it be different? Right, so if it was just a black hole, and, uh, I mean, yeah, if it was only a black hole, if you could somehow see it, then we think black hole is pretty much at the same for all directions, although not necessarily for spinning. Like if you have a spin axis, then that could be a preferred direction. But all these black holes are not just isolated black holes, like they're shining actually because they're eating another star. And so they don't look the same for all directions. Uh, you know, for, for one, some of them are shooting these jets, which you can see in radio or some kind of x rays. And so if you look down to the jet, it looks very different than if you look at it from the side. So would it be like a thing? Um, like if you were to, if you were to take a, a wall and it's black and then you, you, you spray it with like a buckshot and then you have like lights coming from the background. So is it kind of like, shoots up this way and then it would shoot back down that other way as well is is that what happens so they're they're going both ways and up and down yeah i mean i think all of these black holes are emitting some light probably in all directions but not the same amount in all directions so they have like some, more light is going in one direction than the other and there might there are some some directions where you, you there maybe almost no light escapes because there's other matter around the black hole that blocks the light and are they all spinning like a, the same direction? Are they clockwise or counterclockwise? Probably they're all spinning in different directions. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's wild out there. Uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Albagu. Okay, so now is the choose your own adventure part of the evening. Uh, the the observers have set up the telescopes on the field so you can go check out Saturn and Jupiter out there. And for the next hour or so in here, we're going to have our Q&A panel consisting of uh, our speaker, myself, and two other members of the department. So if you had questions that didn't get addressed, now's your time. We'll get started in about five minutes. We're going to bring out the table and set things up. So feel free to do whatever you want, but the, the doors will be open for the next hour if you want to go check out things and come back in or vice versa. Okay, thanks everybody. And we'll get to the questions on YouTube in just a moment. Okay. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, so usually, anytime we have a question, it's like a job in the classroom, it could be the answer. Oh, the answer is no. <laughs> uh, so the. So it's basically the light that would have gone off the other observers and instead gets channeled back to the line of sight. So we get more light, somebody else gets less. Alright, and there is, it, it, we don't actually get all the photons from all the different paths at the same time. So one way you can see that there are these lens photons, the blue mass vessels. There are a few of them that are very uh, and you see different images of them, each one with a different uh, piece of lensing. And they're all showing the same thing, but they're like movies that are out of sync. The light coming in one half and it's two hours, a few months before the light from the other half. Um, I don't have a card, but I do have an email. Uh, it's possible that if you just look at it on the. Wait, so if you just look at uh, it's on the page of the of the yeah. flyer. Yeah, so it has my name on the flyer, and if you just search for that, my department page will come up. And that's what I have to say. Okay, yeah, there's nice to meet you. Okay, thank you for sticking around, die hard uh, astrophysics asking uh, audience. So this is our panel. We'll go through briefly and just give a short introduction. We're happy to take questions on whatever topics you may have. Obviously, a lot of them are probably related to the content of the presentation that was just given. But um, each of us studies some discrete like focus of astrophysics. And so we have things that we're better able to answer about because astrophysics is obviously a pretty broad topic. Um, but we'll take whatever questions you can give. We just can't promise to always have the answer. So um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I am a research scientist here at Caltech. My research is pr predominantly about galaxies like our own Milky Way and their environments and their their atmospheres, what's known as the circumgalactic medium. That's just a fancy word for the kind of low density atmosphere that surrounds galaxies, trying to better understand uh, why some galaxies are actively forming stars and very bright on the sky because of that with young stars, whereas some other galaxies are known as quenched, where they tend to not have a lot of active ongoing star formation. It's like two very different types of galaxies that we see in the sky. So trying to understand that primarily using computer simulations, big supercomputer simulations where we, we form and evolve these galaxies uh, by accelerating time so we can follow their evolution over millions or billions of years. Okay, I'll, I'll pass the mic. Uh, I'm Kareem el -Badri. you just heard me talk. I, I work a lot on black holes, but sort of more generally I work on binary stars, uh, and then even more generally just stars in general. So most of what I'm doing is looking at cases where we had two or more stars that formed together, and at some point in their lives they interact, Sometimes when some, one of them has turned into a black hole, but sometimes uh, when you know when one of them is a regular star or a white dwarf or a neutron star, um, and I'm mostly an observer. Uh, I've actually ch I changed uh, my my balance of observation and theory over the last uh, basically since I started doing astronomy. I started doing more theory, and in the last few years I've started doing more observations. So that means I use data from satellites and from telescopes on Earth to, to look at individual objects or populations and, and try to uh, measure their properties. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kostov. I'm a fourth year graduate student working in the astronomy department here. 
So I work on exploding stars. So that's the step just before they become this stars become black holes. So just before <clears throat> just before they enter the stellar corp phase, they undergo a massive magnificent explosion. And uh, I use this facility located at the Palomar Mountains near San Diego here called the Zwicky Transient Facility. So uh, it's a it's a kind of a transient factory which detects supernovae uh, every night. Um, and well, a fun supernova fact is that just as I'm speaking in every second, there's one star that underwent supernova somewhere out there in the universe. Hi everyone, um, I'm Sam. I'm a second year graduate student. Like Kostov, I also work on supernova, again, mostly using the Zwicky transient facility. Um, but I'm also really interested in the kinds of dust um, that these explosive transients can form. Um, along with the black holes, you might also get this other uh, stuff, which then forms these like, heavier elements, which then can come together and form planets like our own Earth. Um, a fun fact is I was actually an undergraduate at UC Berkeley uh, while Dr. Casey Lamb was working on the gravitational microlensing research. So my first uh, research project is actually dealing with the gravitational microlensing Professor Albadri discussed in his presentation. So I'm also happy to talk about that. Okay, we, we, can, we can take questions from you all. Uh, does anyone, uh, there are also questions online if you're like sheepish and don't want to ask questions. So, oh, okay, here's an ambitious speaker asker. Okay, so what would happen if a black hole encounters a star that's like way more massive, like at least 20 times as massive as a star? Well, the star's like 20 times as massive. Um, yeah, good question. So there are systems like this observed, so we kind of know the answer. Uh, so it depends, I mean, it depends what the orbit is like, uh, but the ones that are observed, they're called high mass X-ray binaries. So they emit X-rays, they're called high mass because it's a massive star. The other ones are called low mass X-ray binaries. We're creative in our names. Um, and they're, they're bright in X-rays because the, so massive stars are constantly losing gas in a wind. Basically they produce so much light that they're like, blowing off their outer layers. And some of that material that they're blowing off will fall onto the black hole and it shines bright in X-rays. So that's how we see them. Um, in some cases, they, you know, they all merge. Uh, that, and, and usually, one way or other, the black hole always wins. Because uh, although the, the other star has more mass, it's much lower density. And so the, the black hole basically will spiral in. It'll first, it'll settle into the core of the more massive star. Uh, and then that might be sort of semi-stable for a while, but eventually the whole thing collapses. Uh, and, you know, much of the star will, will get sucked into the black hole. Some of it might get blown away through the, the uh, accretion energy that's emitted when, when some of it, uh, yeah, but usually, basically, whenever, whenever you ask, like, if two stars interact somehow, which, which one comes out on top, it's usually the more dense one, um, and, and that's a black hole. More, more questions, okay. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Kareem, I'm just curious. Can you speak to like the data sets you must be like working with are pretty must be pretty massive. Like, can you speak to like the software that you use to make your observations and like how how you tell over you know spans of tens or fifteen years how are you able to find out even where to look? Yeah, uh, good question. So. Uh, I mean, it really depends what kind of data, but like the, the data from, we get from Gaia, for example, um, it's basically, a, you know, it's a big table of, of, with two billion rows and a hundred columns or something. Uh, it's a row for each star and then a bunch of observations on each one. Um, and we try a lot of different, you know, we're, we're looking for needles and haystacks. The biggest problem is that even if a satellite produces a really good data set, or the, like the team that processes the data, even if they produce a really good data set, when you have billions of objects, there's always gonna be some data that's bad for some reason. And then if you're looking for a really rare object, like these stars orbiting black holes, uh, even if almost all the data is good, when you look at a, for a kind of object that there aren't very many of, it'll usually be dominated by bad data. So a lot of what we're doing day to day is like trying to figure out how to filter out the bad data and figure out 
what the most promising objects to, to study are more. Um, yeah, so we use, uh, you know, most of my data analysis is in Python. Uh, the, the basic, you know, the first thing we do is just we plot all different quantities against each other and try to look for trends, look for populations of outliers and see whether they're outliers because they're astrophysically interesting or because they're some kind of artifact. Um, some people in my group use uh, machine learning to try to find uh, clusters in, in sort of higher dimensional uh, data that you can't see by eye. Um, and at the end of the day, the, the signal that we're looking for is really just going back to, to Kepler's laws, which we under, so the, the physics is pretty simple. Um, and so uh, in, in, in addition to like any kind of more, more complicated clustering or anything we do, we, we're really just trying to calculate the mass of an object we don't see. And so we have different ways of calculating that and then we just sort by, by mass basically. Um, additional questions. And one thing I should point out, try and hold the mic. There's just problems with the audio. Um, yes, I'll, we'll get everyone, I promise. Um, so at the end of your lecture, you mentioned that, you know, the nearest black holes, you know, maybe approximately 30 light years away. How close would one have to get to our solar system before we could uh, detect it? Um, yeah, how close would a black hole have to get before we can detect it? It's a good question. Uh, it depends on how we would detect it. So one of the harder ways to detect black holes, but that you, uh, if it's close enough, you could, is that none of space is really totally empty. There's like interstellar gas everywhere. And so black holes and stars and everything else is, are constantly accreting a little bit of that interstellar gas. And if you're close enough, uh, that accretion emits some light, right? Because material falls in, that releases gravitational energy, and you can see that in radio or x-ray, x-rays, or even optical light. Um, and so, actually, a, a student I'm working with just wrote a paper about uh, trying to estimate how close you'd have to be to detect that through accretion, uh, and it's pretty close. I think it's, but it's probably in the ballpark of of ten light years, or sorry, of of ten parsecs, which is about thirty light years. So. The closest ones we might be able to detect that way in principle, but the problem is you have to know what, it, right? What we calculate is if you knew where to look and you pointed a telescope there and looked like as deep as we can look, then you would detect something. But we can't afford to scan the whole sky really deep because it takes too long. Uh, so detect it blindly has to be a few times closer than that. Um, yeah, and then other ways you might detect them is through their gravitational influence on, on stars. Uh, what, what one calculation people have done is if a if a black hole gets into like the inner solar system, which is again an orders of magnitude uh, closer, but like if there were a black hole near Pluto's orbit, for example, uh, we would easily detect it because objects in the you know everything would be moving differently, right? Uh, and even if it were like ten to I think up to a hundred times the distance to Pluto when we, we see how like the Voyager satellite moves, for example, uh, if there were some massive objects out there, it would move differently. Um, yeah, I think actually the numbers I gave are, are conservative. I think even farther than that, uh, but I, I forget the exact number. Hey, I think there was one in the back here. Actually, before, before I get to that, a couple questions. So there's not a mutiny online. Um, a couple of questions from the online audience. One was it was partially addressed by one of the one of the questions during the Q and A, and that was, are black hole pairs or any kind of black holes? Do they do you find preferential locations for them that are proximate to the supermassive black hole in our galaxy? Or I, I think you kind of answered it when you showed the image of Andromeda that they were kind of preferentially centrally located, but it's not because. The supermassive black hole is there per se, but it's because it's more in the, the center of the gravitational potential. Yeah, good question. So it, at least among the X-ray bright ones, we see more of them in this very center of the Milky Way than in other places. And we think it's a, a few reasons. Um, one is that near this, we think the stars that are born in the, near the center of the Milky Way are on average more massive. They have a higher typical mass, so more of them turn into black holes. 
Another is that black holes being more massive than the average star sort of sink to the center of the gravitational potential, which is where the black hole is. Another is that there are black holes in these clusters of stars, they're called globular clusters. Some of, the, some of them start there, but then those we think spiral into the center of the galaxy and get deposited there. Uh, and so it's basically all heavy things sent, sink to the center. Okay, cool. Oh, well, and related to that, there was a related question and that is, and sorry, I'll, I'll get to all the questions, I promise. Um, you talked about how the Milky Way's, like you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, the Milky Way's supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, I'm just gonna come on to, <laughs> onto the screen. Sagittarius A star, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy is like 5 million-ish solar masses, times the mass of our sun. But Andromeda's supermassive black hole is like 20 times that. It's like 100 million solar masses. Do we well understand why Andromeda, which is a pretty similar galaxy to our own Milky Way in terms of mass and extent and type, has a 20 times more massive black, supermassive black hole in its interior compared to us? Um, I think the answer is basically just no. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You might be in a better place. No, I was, I, when you pointed that out, I was like, oh, I guess I didn't realize that. Um, and I was trying to, I thought a bit about what might be responsible for it. And there's no obvious thing. I mean, the only thing I can think is that it might be like, just like every person has a different life that they lead based on the, the, the experiences that we have. And that kind of guides your life forward. Galaxies have the same thing. I mean, they're not making choices and stuff. And some, would, some people would hold that we aren't making choices either. The, there's no free will, but let's not get into that. But, um, but galaxies grow by merging with other galaxies over time. And, and that's going to flavor the rest of their life. So if you have a galaxy that you merge with that makes a direct hit with you and contributes a lot of material to the to your core region maybe a lot of that flows onto your supermassive black hole and it grows it more quickly whereas another galaxy has a different life that it's led and it's it merges with different galaxies that don't necessarily feed that supermassive black hole that's the only thing that i can think is just kind of cosmic variance that that might be responsible but yeah i think that makes sense i mean there is one empirical relation that's known it's called the bulge mass black hole mass relation so that ga most galaxies at the center have what's called a bulge it's like a kind of spherical uh, accumulation of stars oh, that's separate from a good the, illustration from the here. Um, and it turns out galaxies that have bigger bulges also have bigger black holes at fixed mass and andromeda does have a bigger bulge than the milky way and we th so that suggests that whatever it is that grows those bulges also grows the black holes and I think that one of the main things that grows the bulges is mergers of galaxies. Uh, and so mergers can grow black holes in two ways. First of all, you can bring in another black hole and the two black holes can merge. But also the merger can bring in a lot of gas, which eventually falls into the black hole. Um, part of the reason it's a hard question, though, is we don't really know how these supermassive black holes got there in the first place. We, we know most galaxies have them. Once they're there, we know how to make them grow by dumping material onto them or merging them with other ones. But we actually don't know, did they come originally from these stellar mass black holes and just merge together a bunch? Or did, were they already born more massive early in the universe uh, and, and get a head start that way? And so if we could answer that, then we might have a better idea of what individual ones, uh, uh, how they had evolved later on too. Okay. Cool. Um, back to the in-person audience here. Uh, Kareem, you said something about, in the question about uh, a black hole, the outer solar system, we would detect it because it would disrupt the bodies out there, like I guess the Kuiper belt or beyond that. But when you were answering that question, you said something about we see the way the voyagers are moving, but then I, I didn't really understand how that connected to that because I mean based on what I know about the voyagers they're going one of them is going up out of the plane of the solar of the planets one's going down and out and they're beyond you know they're beyond the helio sphere so there's not as I understand it much out there I would think they're just moving in straight lines are they not moving in straight lines 
they're not moving exactly in straight lines. Uh, so for example, so we know where all the massive stuff in the, in the solar system is. We think we know where the sun is. We know where Jupiter is. Uh, those are the most important. And then all the other planets are like an order of magnitude less important. And so they're not, you know, they're not moving exactly in straight lines because those, the massive objects are still pulling on them, right? They're far away, but gravity, gravity just gets weaker as you go farther away. It never dies away completely. And so we know they're not thrusting anymore. And so we can predict given our, given our best guess of where all the planets and asteroids and stuff in the solar system are, how they should be moving. And then we can observe how they are moving and those agree really well. Uh, and so if like, if for example, there were another Jupiter mass planet way out in the outer solar system, that would perturb the, that would make them move in sufficiently different from the way they do move that, that we can rule that out already. And a black hole being much more massive than Jupiter would do that to a much larger distance. Yes. You said that most uh, galaxies have supermassive black holes that we know of. Do we know of any galaxy that we can explicitly say this one does not have a supermassive black hole in the middle? Good question. I pretty sure the answer is no. Uh, we know of lots of galaxies where we've looked and we haven't found it, uh, but they, you know, black holes are small and dark. And so <laughs> they're, they, they, they're usually good at hiding. Um, I think that, I mean, the closest galaxies where, uh, where, where people would really like to find one, but haven't are the Magellanic clouds. So they're the two, I had like a picture of the Milky Way as seen by Gaia and they're the two bright spots. You can see them from the Southern hemisphere. So people have looked hard near the centers and not found any dynamical evidence of black hole. You know, you don't see it. You don't see X-ray source that's accreting. You don't see that the stars are moving faster or anything like that. Uh, but unless you really know exactly where to look, uh, it's hard to rule out that the black hole is somewhere else. So the problem with Magellanic clouds is they're not perfectly spherical or like they're not perfectly circular. So they don't have a well-defined center. So it's hard to decide where to look. And there's another galaxy called M33, which is, it's like, I think it's the third biggest galaxy in the local group. So there's the Milky Way and then Andromeda is M31. M33 is like something like 10 or 30 times smaller than the Milky Way, but it, it's like a grand design spiral. So it looks kind of like the Milky Way, but just scaled down. Um, and so it does have a well-defined center and I believe nobody has detected a black hole there and they've set a fairly stringent lower limit that like, if it's there, it's gotta be less than 100,000 times the mass of the sun. So quite a bit smaller than the Milky Way one. Questions? Oh, oh boy, okay. You're next. I'm, I'm always surprised at the emphasis on black holes because the way I see it is I think of all solars as point masses of different sizes. So the first order on astronomy is here these things are moving around and everything else is second order. Uh, what happens to a solar system or what happens about accretion and so forth. So is that the wrong way of, I mean, I'm always puzzled why there's so much focus. I just see them as massive gravity, 10 times sun, 100 times sun, whatever. And is that a wrong way or too simplified or what? So I think that that is the right way to think of a black hole, but it's maybe the wrong way to think of a star. And that stars are not point masses and that they do have surfaces. They're big. You know, we look at the sun or not. It's not a point. It's a large sphere. And it's actually not even very high density compared to black holes, but even compared to sort of normal densities, right? The density of the sun on average is about the same as the density of water. So it's more like a big puffy ball of gas. Uh, I think the thing that gets sort of a lot of physicists excited about black holes is that they're one of the few places where the basic physical laws of the universe that we know of can't make sound predictions. Right, they you kind of predict general relativity predicts the density going to infinity, which we think doesn't really make sense. You know, we don't understand what's happening at the horizon. 
we don't understand if, if uh, you know, space is quantized. So they're sort of, and when you're studying stars and galaxies and stuff, there's a lot of details we don't understand. But for black holes, it's kind of like, what is the basic uh, nature of the thing that we don't understand? So, uh, so there's a question um, from the online audience about the relationship between supernovae and black holes. Can, can, um, can Sam or Kostov kind of elucidate the relationship, but you know, supernovae at some level produce black holes sometimes. So can, can you guys talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so how the life cycle of a star works is that firstly, what is a star? So a star is a battle between a push and a pull force. So we know of gravity and the fact that it's a pulling force. So once you have a lot of mass confined in a certain space, all of that mass would want to basically confine itself under gravity and then basically get attracted and want to become as small as possible. So something has to be uh, stopping that by acting in a radially outward manner. And what happens is that uh, the outward force that's coming in the case of a star is that there is nuclear fusion happening uh, inside the core of a star. And that gives out lots of heat and radiation pressure that acts against this gravity. And when, so it's like, a, you can imagine it like a tug of war. On one side, gravity is pulling, and on the other side, the outward energy from the nuclear fusion is pushing outwards. So for stars like the sun, the gravity and the nuclear fusion energy is at a perfect balance. But what, uh, how it's getting that outward energy is by fusing hydrogen into helium. And one day, stars like the sun, or even more massive uh, than the sun, would run out of all its hydrogen fuel. So it's like how a car is running is based on the amount of petrol or the gas that it has. And one day, when the gas runs out, the car will stop. So one day, uh, the star uh, will basically uh, run out of hydrogen, and then it would form helium. Uh, and based on what Sam's drawing, what happens is that it's, it's a process, it's an iterative process. So once the star runs out of hydrogen, what you have at the core is just helium. And then once you just have helium, you want to now fuse helium into something even heavier. So that process keeps on continuing. Uh, so one way of understanding this diagram is that as you, so you can see H letter indicates hydrogen. And then one, once you basically fuse together to hydrogen, you form something called HE or the helium atom. And then you keep on fusing elements till you reach Fe or iron. So iron is a very stable nucleus. It's the most stable nucleus out of all the elements. So if, if you have to fuse beyond iron, instead of releasing energy, you actually have to give it energy. So a star stops its uh, cooking process in its kitchen once it reaches iron. And so once it stops cooking, what happens is that you lose the outward pressure that was balancing the gravity. And now gravity starts to win. So once gravity starts to win, we have something called a core collapse. Basically, the core of the star starts collapsing. And what happens is it's, it keeps on collapsing till it becomes very, 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 very dense. So the, uh, it, 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 keep, it keeps on collapsing till it becomes so dense that one spoon of that dense material is equal to the weight of, say, a whole mountain range. So once it reaches that dense, the, all the outer core and the outer parts of the star basically bounce off that very dense inner part, and then it, it just flies out. So when it flies out, we call that a supernova explosion. And uh, the energy of a supernova explosion is so high that you can imagine that the sun has been burning for 5 billion years. It would keep on burning for another 5 billion years. The total amount of energy that the sun would release in its 10 billion years, a supernova explosion releases that much energy in one second. So it's that energetic process. So once that is done, what, ha you, what you are left with is that very, very dense core, which I call, which is called in the astronomy community, a neutron star. So as I said, one spoon of neutron star is equal to the weight of a whole mountain range. But what if even um, a neutron star, the gravity of the neutron star is even too massive? So uh, what's holding, what's balancing a neutron star is something called a neutron degeneracy pressure. 
So it's basically, I don't want to go into the details, but it's just some uh, quantum mechanics prediction that basically two people cannot have the same identity. So it's like two, two neutrons cannot have the same identity. So you cannot compress a neutron star or a, basically a ball of neutron, neutron star denser than it already is. But if it's even more massive than that, even that degeneracy pressure cannot hold it. Then gravity wins again and you basically just collapse further and further and there's nothing to stop that gravity uh, collapse process and then then you form a black hole um, so that's how super that's how the life cycle of a star supernova black hole is related i hope it made some sense yes yeah it was good that's a good explanation additional okay oh i think i promised you the next question and then and then i'll get to you I've got many questions, but um, so our galaxy is millions of objects rotating around the, the, the central core. So these hundred million black holes, are they moving in basically that same pattern that, that uh, kind of in parallel with the visible stars that we see moving around the galaxy? That's a great question. Um, so, it, it so many of them it seems like are uh, or, you know, they're 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 similar uh, in that they like uh, yeah it, 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 if they if they form without a kick then they will orbit just like everything else. But the reason we think some of them may be orbiting differently is that during the supernova the supernova might not be totally symmetric. And so if the explosion is asymmetric and more energy is, or momentum is released in one direction, then there'll be a recoil and the black hole will fly off in the other direction. Uh, and observationally, it's pretty uncertain whether, you know, whether the kicks always exist and how strong they are, but uh, there are a lot of theoretical predictions that the average black hole should be born flying in a random direction at something like 100 kilometers a second or up to a couple hundred kilometers a second. And that's about how fast the stars are orbiting around the Milky Way. So if, you, if a star starts in a nice disk-like orbit around the Milky Way and then it's born with a random kick in a random direction, it can end up in a totally different orbit, you know, going uh, perpendicular to all the other stars or counter-rotating uh, or uh, a really hyperbolic or, or uh, elliptical orbit where it goes really far out and comes back in. First. Thank you. My question is related to dark matter. So basically, if you analyze the like the movement of the galaxies, you see that it does not agree with the theory of mass that we observe. So I have seen uh, one paper that relates basically tries to explain the existence of dark matter uh, with black holes. Do you agree with that? Or do you think we need dark matter? Um, yeah, it, I mean, so a lot of people have had this idea over the years. Um, and because of that, people have, have tried as hard as they can to make black holes work as dark matter, uh, but they don't seem to work. Uh, and, and the basic problem is there just aren't enough of them. So that even though there are 100 million of them, it's a lot, but the total mass you get is still something like a billion solar masses. Uh, and for the Milky Way, you need closer to a trillion solar masses or you know, hundreds of billions. Um, and so I talked about this way of detecting black holes with lensing where they pass in front of background star. This survey I talked about called OGLE and there was another survey before it. The main goal of those surveys was to try to find out whether black holes are dark matter or like objects like black holes, whether they could be the dark matter by just monitoring background stars and seeing how often they happen to move in front of background stars. And although they do detect them sometimes, the, the rate of them that you get is not large enough to explain the amount of missing mass. Yeah, I'll get to you in just a second. Yeah, we don't like invoking dark matter as some magical thing that we can't see. It'd be nice to make it black holes, but it doesn't seem to fit. 
Do we have an estimate of the diameter of, like, for example, the Sagittarius A star at the center of the Milky Way, or any of the other black holes that we've observed, or, or, an, or an average diameter for for like supermassive black holes, as opposed to because they're they're on the order of kilometers, right? Uh, yeah, good question. So, first of all, you have to decide what what the diameter of a black hole means. So the simplest scale is the size of the event horizon within which light can't escape. And so for a black hole, the mass of the sun, that's three kilometers, uh, but it scales linearly with the mass of the black hole. So a 10 solar mass, one at 30 kilometers, and then Sagittarius A star, if it's, if it's four million solar masses, it should be 12 million kilometers. So still small by astrophysical standards, but, but much bigger than solar mass ones. I think I'll, I'll get you. Isn't there a question? <laughs> yes. Just... So you were saying about um, when a black hole is formed and sometimes it gets kicked out. So when that happens, is do we see a wave or a ripple through the universe? Can you detect that? And how far out does it go? Does it is it, does it go to the ends of the universe, or what happens? Good question. Um, so I, it depends how strong the kick is. Basically, if the kick is more than something like 500 kilometers a second, that's the escape velocity of the Milky Way. So if it's faster than that, it'll leave the Milky Way and go off to, you know, it'll keep, it'll keep going. It might, might get to some other galaxy eventually, but it's gone. We think most kicks are probably less than that, but the fastest ones are probably more than that. The, the, re, the main way we can measure the kicks is we can look at neutron stars, which are also formed in supernovae, but are easier to observe, and so we can measure how fast they're going. And the fastest of those are going fast enough that they would escape the Milky Way. So probably some of them just go off careening into extragalactic space, uh, but most of them will just get put on some different orbit around the Milky Way. Um, as for whether the kick produces... Uh, like ripples in space time. Um, I think like right during the supernova, uh, when you know you have a bunch of non-spherical matter that's kind of high densities and, and deforming and changing, that there is a gravitational wave signal associated with that. So so yes, uh, but that doesn't last very long. And I think it's strong enough that if one happened in the Milky Way today, uh, we'd have a decent chance of detecting it. Uh, or you know we'd have some ch we'd have hope of detecting it, but if it happened at a diff at another galaxy uh, outside the Milky Way, it would be too weak for us to detect. Uh, we know like the black hole absorbs all light and we can't really see it, but what what would it take for a human to actually see inside a black hole? Like, do you, what advancement in technology, or is it like uh, us as humans can never really see what what inside a black hole is? Um, we can already see. We j you just have to you you just have to. Uh, go inside. So, you know, if you, if you, if you fall in, you can see on the way down. Uh, and and, and, and uh, there, there's actually nothing special probably that happens to you when you cross the event horizon. You can keep seeing everything around you. It's just, you can't tell anybody what you saw. And so, but, but you get to know the secrets of the universe for a while before, before you die. But is there a way to see it outside the horizon, or we can never see it outside the horizon? Uh, from outside the horizon, when it, I think it's it's just a basic rule of the universe that you can't see inside because the way we see is light escaping, and light can't escape. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Ah. All right, I think my question will be directed more towards, um, I think it was Sam, uh, you mentioned that uh, your particular area of interest was um, super, obviously supernova and what comes out of it. And that's pretty much my question, like what is it that comes out of it and like why are you so interested, like why did it spark such an interest uh, for you to decide to actually research that topic? Yeah. 
Great question. Um, so I'll sort of leave off where Kostov did um, in the formation of either a neutron star or a black hole. Um, so these are really, really massive stars, and it's really just the core um, that is forming either this neutron star or this black hole. It's this very, very dense core. Um, but that's only a small fraction of the mass that's in these massive stars. So sort of on the way here, I'll go back to this plot. Um, most of the universe uh, at the be very, like, beginning of the Big Bang, we really only had hydrogen and helium. So sort of the two lightest elements, a little bit of lithium too. Um, but that's a pretty boring universe to live in. Uh, neither you nor I are made of hydrogen and helium, besides in some quantities. We're in mo most uh, uh, heavier elements. Oxygen is really important for us. Uh, we're made mostly of water. Um, uh, carbon, obviously, very, very important for life. Um, and it's these massive stars which actually form these more massive elements. So the sort of carbon and oxygen and all these other really cool heavy stuff that's formed um, by these massive stars has to then get out in the universe somehow. Um, and then in order to form planets like us and life um, on those planets. So uh, in supernova explosions, you have a chance to actually blow out a lot of those outer layers. So maybe, you know, the inner 10% of your mass, the inner 20% of your mass goes into forming a neutron star or black hole. Well, that's a whole bunch of other stuff that just gets blown away in the supernova explosion. Um, so uh, creating these, and this gets mixed into the interstellar medium, and then that interstellar medium goes on to form new stars, and those new stars have um, dusty disks of these heavier elements around them, and then those uh, heavier elements can then go on and form planets. Uh, that's really exciting. So it's in you know, some ways, supernova really are our cosmic origins. To understand where we came from, we need to understand these supernova, and so all the material that comes out of them. Um, as for why I'm interested in supernova, truthfully, I'm a bit of a pyromaniac, and they're just really, really cool because uh, they're massive explosions. Yeah. To go off of that, how close will one have to be for it to interact with our space and space? Ooh, this is a good question. When do we have to worry about yeah. uh, one going off too close and it being bad news, RIP Earth, something like that? So it depends a little bit um, on orientations and stuff. Like if there's a bunch of dust in between us and a supernova, we can maybe be saved, um, but that gets gets absorbed. I don't know. How close would we have to be before things got really bad for us? Yeah. I think there are multiple components of a supernova which can kill, kill us in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> so if it just has to be the shock kinetic energy, so if it's at the distance of, of the solar system, then like if, the, like if there were a star that was at a distance away from us compared to say how far we are away from the sun, then we would be blown off by just the kinetic energy of the shock. But, if, uh, but we know that there's no star that's nearby enough, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but uh, the ones which are nearby, which are like four light years or more away, so the shock, just the shock won't be enough to kill us. But there are other things that get emitted in this process. So as I said, in one second, it emits energy equal to 10 billion years. So most of this energy comes out, some of this energy comes out in the form of this high energy photons called gamma rays. And they can come from a very far distance. So um, if, it, if it were nearby, I would, I, my guess would be if, if it were like say hundreds of light years or a few tens of light years away, and um, there's a good chance that the gamma rays that would be emitted in this explosion could hit us. And that would basically disrupt all the atmosphere and most likely life. Um, yeah, I, the most dangerous things are the gamma rays. Um, by the way, there's a very nice video on this exact topic by the very Satyam channel, uh, if I pronounce the name right. Um, so the exact, exact question of the video was, uh, how far does a supernova have to be for it to kill us? And it was released like a few weeks ago, so I would recommend watching that, yeah. The Veri Veritasium? Oh, Veritasium. Veritasium. I don't know my evidence. That's okay. Um, <laughs> gamma rays to turn us into the Incredible Hulk. That's optimistic, optimistic. Yeah. Um, the thing that I recall reading is that, so Betelgeuse, one of the nearest, one nearby bright star, it's the, it's the upper left shoulder in Orion. It's a red supergiant. And it's imminently going to turn into a supernova. Imminently is in like, in the next 10,000 years, not 
Well, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> but um, it's reasonably nearby. But I've been told that we don't need to worry about it. So that's some level, uh, an upper limit on how close these things can be. Hopefully they're correct. The prediction that when this goes off, it's not going to hit us with enough gamma rays to do any damage. Yeah. From a less killing us perspective and more life, we already are supernova, which have reached Earth. The material that we're made out of did come from these massive stars. So it did get end up getting recycled and then to, to form the sun. So if you wait long enough, <laughs> every supernova will eventually sort of mix mix through and you'll you'll get a chance to see one up close whenever you pick up a rock. <laughs> Yeah, I, I detected there's a certain amount of envy that Andromeda Galaxy has a much larger central black hole than we do. Uh, has anybody taken a crack at when we merge with Andromeda what the ultimate central black hole will be? That's a that's an interesting question. So I know there was a, a major study you can find the video online, we've shown it here before, that looks at a hydrodynamical simulation, a computer simulation trying to follow the merger of the Andromeda galaxy with our own Milky Way galaxy and kind of shows different, the evolution of that over the next five to eight billion years and what it'll look like and what the end result is, you know, this galaxy that is is both of us when it, once it's merged. I don't think in that paper, that paper came out like 13 years ago, something like this, uh, Vandermeerl and Besla and I'm trying to get the other co-authors, but I don't think they look at the supermassive black hole. I don't know. I would imagine that it would be both the combination between our supermassive black hole, the supermassive black hole in Andromeda, as well as it gaining additional mass, because it's not just these two point masses, the black hole that merge together, but stuff will fall into that because this is going to be a very messy chaotic merger between these systems and when you have multi-body gravitational systems a lot of that mass falls in and a lot of that mass gets ejected and so uh yeah i i my guess this is a guess uh would be that it would double in size something like that but i haven't done the the full simulation to know We'll have to wait and see. We've got, you know, seven billion years to wait. So uh, there's a question in back first. So um, in theory, how unstable would um, white holes be if they were to exist? Sorry, how unstable would black holes be if they exist? Uh, white holes. I yes. Well, I think I've the the thing I've heard the term white holes a lot in sort of a pop science context, but I actually don't know whether there's a like mathematical theory of what they are. A little bit, but not much. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I don't I don't really have a good answer because I yeah. <laughs> Sam, do you wanna? I can I can chat briefly about this. So. Um, I cried the night of my GR final. <laughs> this is somewhat related to white holes. Um, <laughs> um, so the idea of a white hole, so you have, actually, maybe I'll try to sketch this. Again, I passed GR because my professor was extremely kind. I probably shouldn't have. So I don't know that I'm totally qualified to draw this for you. Um, but... Yes, general relativity, which is the sort of equations which um, govern the physics near black holes as best we understand them. Um, what we do this often is with a space-time diagram that's basically just considering the four axes of reality. So we have our three spatial axes and then a time axis. So if you sort of are to draw a black hole, again, I can't draw in four dimensions, so I'm going to scrunch this down to two dimensions, a maybe x direction and then a time direction. Light travels along 45 degree paths um, in the units that we use for general relativity because photons are traveling at the speed of light. So this is some like time axis, this is some spatial axis. And then um, as you're going along this, these paths, you're traveling at sea. 
Um, so the whole idea is that things are separated in these space-time diagrams. Um, you can't have things separated um, in space and time more than that are causally related that travel faster than the speed of light. Uh, that basically translates to allowed regions um, in this diagram. So if you imagine my black hole is sort of, you know, along these lines here, I'm basically sketching out its its boundaries. Well, there's sort of the corresponding like 45 degree thing here. So if a black hole is like one side of this diagram, then the white holes are the other side. So instead of stuff falling in, stuff is coming out of white holes. So there was a theory a while back that maybe quasars, which are these um, black holes at the centers of galaxies, which are extremely active and are throwing off a whole bunch of light and stuff, might be white holes. This is not true. They are black holes. Um, and it's just accretion, which is driving this, this power. Um, I don't think white holes exist. Um, I, will, I will assert that. But again, I am an observational astronomer who does supernova. I don't know a lot about general relativity, um, but I don't think there are really, we don't have, we definitely don't have any strong evidence for white holes um, right now, I'll say. I don't know, Cameron, did you want to add anything to that? Sure. I, I agree, there's no, there's no significant observational evidence for white holes. I, I, the only thing I was going to add is that, yeah, the, there's this theoretical framework for the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is the, the wormhole that things can travel through. And essentially that, that doesn't, you know, those are solutions to the Einstein equations, but they don't, not all solutions to the Einstein equations are real, are real physical phenomena. And, and so, yeah. And plus with those models, if something falls through that, that, that wormhole, it collapses immediately and it doesn't allow any more stuff to go through. So. I, I was I was reading. I didn't just repeat what you just said, did I? No, that was okay. 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 Yeah. I just yeah. I just want to add a line. So regarding the stability, I think one way of like having a white hole is that if you have a black hole which is actually spinning very fast, there's a theory called quantum loop gravity, which where according to it, instead of having a singularity, singular, singularity where you have a single dense point of like infinite density, you could have a ring of infinite density. And then if you go beyond that, then you would go through the wormhole that Cameron described and then enter through a white hole where, so white hole basically is the opposite of black hole where black hole you cannot escape and white hole, you would be thrown out immediately at the speed of light. So, uh, but I think mathematically, the whole thing of uh, formation of a uh, ring-like singularity is very unstable, as Cameron said. So. But also, it's in a totally different space-time. It's in like in a yeah. totally different universe. It's a crazy theory, but yeah, again, there's no real significant observational evidence for it. Ah, I'm gonna run into the wall. Uh, coincidentally, like within the past week, I saw that there has been a book published recently, like a mainstream publisher, you can find it like at Barnes and Noble or other booksellers, what have you, called White Holes. And it's a relatively short volume. Um, so if anyone's interested, they should look for that. I can't remember the name of the author, but I was glancing through it and it was making my head hurt. But one of the ways that he described it was that like, it, so, you know, a black hole, we're here, we're looking at the black hole and it's black because no light's escaping and the white hole is what if you were on the inside of the black hole looking out? And anyway, it's a couple hundred pages and he addresses all this theoretically. So if anyone is interested, this book is out there relatively new. I don't remember who he, I don't remember his name or his CV or whatever, but, but like it's, you know. Interesting. Okay, so it's not it's not too hopefully too fringe. Okay, thank you. That's a good a good suggestion. Um, there was one question online that I wanted to get to because it, it there were actually a few questions that it's tied into what we were talking about before. Um, and these are you know you talked about well the previous diagram that we had there was all about um, the various elements that were kind of produced in the interior of a star and in the interior of a of a supernova. But the the question was how do how do all the elements get produced? Like, do, do you have, you know, there was some research that was done a few years ago that suggested that elements are produced in merging neutron stars. Do you get any kind of new elements in merging black holes? 
Um, or is it predicted? I mean, it's probably not observed, but do you get regions of like an enhancement in certain in certain elements in the regions around black holes or black hole mergers? And and you've only drawn this to iron, so how do you get the heavier elements than iron? Like there's uranium out there and gold and platinum and lots of things. Yes. How do we get things heavier than iron? So the reason we go up to iron and stars is that's where you can start getting energy. You can start, you know, generating the energy you need to support against gravity for stars. But yes, there are more elements beyond iron all the way out to to, to really heavy and unstable things. Um, these are really, really well formed um, by neutron star mergers. The reason for this is, is because basically you need, first of all, to get to heavier elements, you need to actually put energy into the system. So supernova fits the bill for that, um, uh, and neutron star mergers fit the bill for that. Um, black hole mergers aren't quite as good, actually, because there isn't actually a ton of matter um, that can be around them. You might have some kind of accretion disk or something um, around them, but you maybe don't have a ton of matter. Whereas with the neutron stars, you actually do, you know, have quite a bit of stuff that isn't, you know, gone from the universe as we know it, never to return, as it is the case with matter inside black holes. Uh, it's gone forever. Um, and with neutron star, with neutron star mergers, you have a lot of neutrons, which can then go on to these heavier, heavier elements. So um, a neutron is basically a, a proton and electron, which became friends and are, are combined. Um, but you can uh, then get more and more neutrons onto these, you know, iron elements and stuff, and get heavier and heavier and heavier just by accreting neutrons essentially onto your nuclei. Um, so there are two processes by which this happens. There's the S process and the R process, which are just referring to the rate of neutron captures um, onto these nuclei. So uh, the S process is the slow process. It's the like slow neutron uh, accreting onto these, these nuclei, um, which don't quite get up to the heaviest elements. Um, neutrons tend actually kind of unstable, so they sort of decay and maybe you don't get quite to the heaviest things. Um, with our process, nucleosynthesis, you get these very rapid, um, essentially accretion, uh, uh, I, I, I love the word accretion as an astronomer, it's not quite accretion. You get this, these rapid um, neutrons attaching to these, these nuclei and then they just get heavier and heavier and heavier um, and form these heaviest elements. So yes, uh, neutron star mergers are one of the main processes by we, which we think we get these heavier elements. Um, and supernova too, actually you can get heavier elements out here, um, but uh, uh, they're not formed in as large quantities as you see in, in neutron stars, and you don't quite get the, quite get the heaviest uh, elements. Yeah, does either of you want anything to add? I just want to add that there was observational evidence for formation of gold in the merger of this dense things called neutron stars, and Caltech had a huge role to play in that discovery. So if you search Caltech strikes gold, I think there are multiple <laughs> articles. <laughs> Um, I finished my question. Okay. Thank you. Is, is, is uranium the heaviest, the absolute heaviest element that we can observe? No, there are definitely heavier elements. You can make heavier elements. So there's sort of this, what's called a valley of stability stability. Um, so in the centers of nuclei of atoms, you have protons and you have neutrons. Um, the relative numbers of protons and neutrons sort of depend on your mass. Um, this is why we have different isotopes, right? So for hydrogen, it's most commonly just a single proton is the most common isotope of hydrogen. Uh, but as you get to, to heavier elements, you might have carbon-13, right? So uh, different numbers of neutrons in the nuclei. Um, but the sort of value of stability sort of reaches its limit. Um, at some massive thing. I actually don't know what the most massive stable element is. I just thought of uranium because I don't know. Stable, stable, stable forever stable? Well, stable-ish. I mean, uranium is not that stable, Stable right? forever, I think it's lead. It's lead, yeah. I think. So, but then there are other things which are, you know, still around, like, that, that you can, like, mine the ores of and stuff and, you know, maybe last, have half-lives of, you know, millions, billions of years. But, you know, nothing's truly, truly stable, right? Um, except maybe protons. <laughs> um, there, was, there was one last question. Oh, um, 
Kareem, during your talk, you talk, you mentioned briefly Hawking radiation, this radiation that that causes black holes to lose mass slowly over time. Um, do you think there's ever the hope of actually being able to observationally detect Hawking radiation? Yeah, good question. I think it's not out of the question. It, I mean, it depends on what kinds of black holes exist. So if there are low mass black holes that are formed through some astrophysical process, either very early in the universe where we have ideas or through something we haven't thought of, uh, they'd actually be relatively easy to detect with Hawking radiation if they're close by because the amount of radiation and the wavelength of the radiation ch changes as the black hole gets smaller. And so the, the black hole basically loses, loses mass faster and the wavelength of the radiation gets from longer to shorter as the black hole gets smaller. And so the paper, I think by Stephen Hawking, titled Black Hole Explosions, or something like that, it's one of his more cited papers. It just says, when a black hole dies, its last breath will be like an actual explosion. I think comp with energy comparable to, to a few hydrogen bombs or something like that, um, just because the, the, you know, the last few seconds are the... The, the wavelength of the Hawking radiation is sort of typically about the size of the horizon. And so that goes from very rapidly from optical to UV to X-rays to gamma rays, and, it, and it's all very fast at the end. So if there are uh, low mass black holes out there, we'll see them reaching their, their, the end of their lives uh, on, on time scales we can observe. And we would basically see these very small cosmic explosions you know, explosions that are large by terrestrial standards, but small compared to supernovae or most things that stars do, uh, but we could observe those. Does, it, does, it, does a black hole make a noise? Does, does a black hole make a noise? Uh, emit acoustic waves? Yeah, that's a, uh, I mean, they make these gravitational waves. And does people, it have sound? Like, probably not. I mean, so sound, though, like, what what is sound actually? Sound is waves traveling through a gas. Like some, like, uh, like, um, there was a staticky like <clears throat> like different planets make a, 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 a they have like a staticky noise or something. There's like a a frequency. So is there like a frequency coming from a black hole? So black holes do have well-defined frequencies and that like if you perturb a black hole at what frequency will it vibrate, for example, is a question you can ask. But it's not sound in the sense that if you were there, you would hear it. Um, a lot of times, well, astronomers and, and other kinds of physicists will take some signal that's not really sound and turn it into sound as like another way of displaying it. Uh, but it's not... You know, it's a different phenomena than than sound that we hear, which is like waves traveling through air, basically. I'll just add on what Kareem said. Yeah, you have to have a medium through which sound acoustic waves can travel. And for the most part, Earth and other planets are rare in the universe in that we have a high enough density of stuff through which those acoustic waves can travel. You know, the, the claim that like, what is it, no one can hear you scream in space uh, is true because most of space is so devoid of material, it won't propagate acoustic waves through it in the same way that when I say something, it's causing the, the molecules in the air to vibrate against each other until that propagates out to your, your eardrum and, and then your brain registers it. There's just not enough stuff through most of the universe to do that. And so, yeah, as Kareem says, like when you when you hear the the chirp that the black holes make when they merge together from the LIGO results, that's not a real chirp. That's a chirp that they change the frequency with which the gravitational waves are propagating outward into an acoustic wave because it happens to be the same frequency range that we can hear sound, but it's not it's not really a sound that you would hear. So there are acoustic waves in stars that are like seismic waves in, in the earth. Like when there's a, an earthquake, 
those those acoustic waves travel through the earth and in different reg regions like you can see uh seismometers all across you know north america um move even when the 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 earthquake took place 100 or 1000 miles away because those waves are propagating through the interior of the earth and it happens the same thing with stars they resonate like a bell at different frequencies and so astronomers again will as kareem said will try and use sound as a way to teach us about these frequencies because we have an intuition about sound but those things aren't really like you wouldn't you wouldn't hear it in space because there's just no there's no matter to propagate those waves sadly um uh okay so we'll do we'll do two more questions and then we gotta we gotta we gotta gotta roll thank you um i have a pretty easy question for anyone um what made you want to go into astronomy because initially i wanted to study astronomy but someone told me it was all physics and when i was 18 i'm like oh, i can't do physics so i did chemistry but then i was at your talk sam and you said that in astronomy like chemistry is not really like the astronomers don't like chemistry so <laughs> that made me think i'm like i made the right choice because i love chemistry and math but like did you guys go into astronomy because you like physics is that true or what made you go into that? I should I should clarify. There are astronomers who love chemistry and are really <laughs> interested in it. Um, I'm not very good at chemistry, much like general relativity. <laughs> um, at least for me, the reason I I'm really interested in astronomy is I I really um, I'm really interested in physics. I really enjoy the applications of math. I think some of the the stuff we study in astronomy is just really, really cool. Um, again, I'm a bit of a pyrenic. I really love explosions. If you're too into explosions on Earth, you get put on watch lists. Um, <laughs> studying supernova, uh, I'm less interesting to the FBI. Uh, the maybe I would have been otherwise. On <laughs> this is on YouTube. This on YouTube. I don't think our viewership has that many FBI agents. Yeah, but, uh, uh, sorry, anyone in the J. Edgar Hoover building. Um, <laughs> Please don't put me on a watch list. Yeah. I promise I'm only interested in space-based explosions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, firstly, uh, with regard to chemistry, so there are some aspects of astronomy which are very chemistry heavy these days. For example, exoplanets. So mo uh, like, like the current frontier or, or a large part of it it exists in how light passes through the atmospheres of planets and watching the absorption lines. Uh, for example, after JWST went out, that it's it's that like it's even a hotter topic right now. And uh, chemistry has a huge role to play in it. So there are like branches of astronomy. There's one I think one called cosmochemistry, like how the element composition abundances change across um, how the universe has evolved. And exoplanets, I think these two are like big on chemistry. And in terms of solar system stuff too, trying yeah. to date the different structures in, like the planets in the solar system and their surface features and such trying to, you can use isotopes to figure that out and that's all chemistry. So that's a big, big application. And regarding why I got to astronomy, I think uh, personally for me, uh, my favorite part was that I think it's one of the faster evolving f sciences right now. So you can see that uh, compared to some other fields, uh, like things are changing on a much faster pace, like 10 years back, what we knew about black holes or something else. Right now we know uh, like, like the textbooks are being rewritten at a faster pace than some of the other fields. And that got me excited to join the field. Yeah, I think uh, my reasoning is kind of similar to Kostov's in that uh, I, I like that the frontier of knowledge in astronomy is pretty close in that if you're an astronomy grad student and you know you have some background in physics but you you're not an expert in anything yet you could there are in within most subfields you can start working on some new problem and within you know a few months or a year uh, you'll know more about that you'll know things about that subject that nobody else knows and you, you know you can contribute to the, the research community. I, my sense is faster than at least other fields of physics that I know of. I don't really know how what it's like in, in other sciences. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot of unexplored questions. There's a lot of public data. So it, there's not much barrier of entry also. Also, if you wanna switch fields, like now I'm working on black holes. If tomorrow I was like, you know, I really want to work on, I don't know, I, supernovae. <laughs> I, 
I could, you know, I could start reading papers about supernovae and it would take me a little while to get up to speed and catch up with what they've been doing, but uh, I have enough of a sort of background in the, in what the basic physics are and, and, and I know enough of the story that in maybe six months or something, I could start writing papers about it. Um, so there's not, maybe, maybe the thing about astronomy is just, we don't know that much. And so, <laughs> and so uh, it, it's, it's easier to get so to the So it's easier to now. get to up yeah. to speed, yeah. I agree. I, yeah, I'm not gonna belabor the point. I agree with all of these, these reasons. Except the, I don't belong on a watch list. I'm not <laughs> trying, to, trying to explode things. Um, okay, our final question before we retire for the evening. You had a question. Yes. Um, hi, yeah, just about observing the black holes in LIGO. It, it, now it's daily. And what, what changed? How did, what are we observing now? How is it just that it was confirmed, so therefore the math worked? And it's it, in the observations, the dust now we can see through with JW, JWST and stuff. So is it just new the new waves coming in that we're more sensitive to because it was once confirmed, or are there just well now we know so much we can observe them by all kinds of methods? So I, I think for most things it's that we're be building better technologies. So for LIGO, for example, the you know each generation of LIGO has gotten more sensitive. So LIGO measures really small uh, changes in the distance between two detectors. And for a long time, it could measure that those to like 10 to the minus 20 meters or something, which was really small, but not quite small enough. And then once it got to 10 to the minus 21, I'm not sure that's actually the right number, but it's, uh, you know, once it got a factor of 10 more sensitive, suddenly that was the sensitivity we needed to be able to detect the brightest events. And then another factor of 10 more sensitive than that, you can detect even, even more. And the universe is a big place, so if you can just detect the brightest objects, you only detect the closest ones. But as soon as you can get more sensitive, you can detect things out to a larger distance, which is a larger volume. Uh, and you never, at least for a, lo a long time, you won't run out of space uh, if you just get more sensitive. Um, and I mean, LIGO's had a lot of funding for a long time, but largely that funding was just given to them, like, hopefully you'll get everything working. And then they got it working. And then, as Kareem says, once the, they beat down the, the, the noise, and so they're more and more sensitive over time, and they're gaining a little bit of sensitivity each time. And so it allows them to probe a much larger volume of, of events. And so there are more, there's like an exponential increase in the number of events that they can detect because they've they've beat down these noise sources and, and you can, you can, you're more sensitive. I mean, it's just like, if you're in a city, you can only see a handful of stars in the sky because of the light pollution. But as you go deeper into the country, you're more sensitive because you're beating down the amount of noise, i.e. in this case, the light pollution, the scattered light in our atmosphere. And as you get farther and farther outside of the cities, you can see many, many more stars that are present. It's not that those stars are new or anything like that. It's just your, sensitivity increases so i'll add one really quick thing to that we are caltech astronomers so we think a lot about ligo because a lot of the work for ligo is done here there are actually other gravitational wave detectors uh which are online now and ones which are planned um in europe there's virgo and in japan there's kagra 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 um and then there's a uh, another planned mission which will go to space called lisa um, which will be orders of magnitude and more sensitive than our existing instruments so ligo isn't the only gravitational wave detector um, that we have now and of course there actually are two ligos right separated um across the they're United also States. building ligo india which is yeah. a similar one and and they're all working well at least the ones that you named not lisa but kagra and virgo they're largely working together so sharing data sets when they're all online because you're more effective when you're working as a team like that's that's a, that's like a great message for us all right like we're much more effective at working as a team to be able to detect things than people working in in isolation so there's a huge amount of collaboration in the gravitational wave communities
Yeah, so Lisa's better for, uh, will be fantastic for a lot of reasons. Um, it won't replace LIGO. It's going to be sort of sensitive to different kinds of uh, events because it's going to be sensitive to sort of different frequencies of gravitational waves. So you can sort of think of an analogy to light waves, right? We have optical telescopes, we have x-ray telescopes, we have radio telescopes. They're all seeing light, but sort of light at different frequencies. While gravitational waves also have different frequencies sort of depending on their origins. So our, our LIGO detectors are really sensitive to merging black holes and merging neutron stars. Um, our LISA things might be sensitive more to wider separated binaries um, and, and sort of different different kinds of sources. Um, there are sort of two reasons it's really great to, to go to space. Uh, the first reason is you can just build really, really, really long uh, baselines, really like uh, long distances. And what you're measuring actually with gravitational waves is you're measuring how much like space is changing. And it's some sort of like percentage, right? So if you are measuring, you know, some a deflection of 1%, you're measuring that over 100 meters, okay, maybe you're measuring just like one meter. This is not gravitational waves, right? Gravitational waves are much, much less. Uh, but then you move to like something that's like uh, 100,000 meters, well, now that 1% deflection is is a much a much greater distance. So LISA, the, the different satellites will be more separated. Um, and there also will be less noise, like things are uh, on Earth, right? there's a lot of, a lot of noise, uh, earthquakes, uh, people walking around, microwaves. Actually, there's the, the LIGO 40 meter lab um, here on campus, which was sort of a test bed uh, for the four kilometer for LIGO arrays. They can actually see um, like uh, times between classes. So they actually see the effect of people walking um, during like say uh, Caltech has classes like eight to 9.30 and then so from like 9.30 to 10 o'clock when the next classes start, they can actually see that signal. Um, so these things are just crazy sensitive. Um, so if you can go to space where there's less sources of noise, um, that's another reason why Lisa will be more sensitive. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us tonight. Let's have a round of applause for our, our panel and our speaker. Um, again, our next one of these will be January 12th, Friday, January 12th, and our next Astronomy on Tap will be fr uh, Monday, January 29th. Have a wonderful holiday, and we'll, we'll be back then. Thanks. <laughs>